this is all of our celebrations. So uh, I'm grateful to be here. My name is Ken and I am a grateful recovering codependent. Hello, everybody. Um, um, I'm just, I, I'm absolutely delighted to present this workshop. It's one I haven't done before, so it's fairly, it's new for me. Um, although the information isn't new in my, my recovery experience, but putting it in this format is new. Uh, so I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, the process of working the six and seven steps and transforming knowledge into action, which is what the six and seven step is really about it's all about action and it took me a long time uh, in prior recovery to coda to recognize that that the six and seven steps weren't passive so i wanted to take a little bit of time to just talk about steps um, in general steps the steps are the program of recovery uh, we can read information, we can watch videos, we can do workshops. Um, uh, I've heard people over the years say, well, I, you know, I, I go to a lot of meetings. And I say, well, have you worked the steps? No. Um, what, I learned at a very, very young age in another 12-step program is that meetings are not recovery and that knowledge is not recovery. That recovery is all about action, and it's the actions that I take that uh, that help uh, uh, transform me from the inside out as I move through the steps. And so uh, we basically there was no CODA program when when both Mary and I were starting to work on codependence. There was simply a therapist that had been through treatment. Uh, at a program that I was working at as a, as a um, clinical director. And uh, um, we, both Mary and I trusted her. And so we were in serious shape, uh, needed to talk with someone about um, what, <laughs> in my codependent thinking, if they were, if she would just get Mary straightened out, everything would be okay. You know? It had nothing to do with me. Even though I worked in the industry, I taught, codependence treatment to clinicians. Uh, I was sincerely deluded about myself being a codependent in any way, shape, or form. So um, through various experiences, we ended up working with this person. And um, uh, for a, a, a few years, uh, both his and her therapy and then our therapy and um, on a weekly basis, it, we, we both needed that. So it, it, we, we were kind of dropped right into, uh, by both of our higher powers into, you know, a, a master's program in, in our own health, healing, growth, and recovery for codependence. Um, and we didn't know, you know, there was no step process. There was no CODA program. There was no program that addressed, um, uh, codependence as a continuing process when someone may leave treatment, when they might uh, have gone to therapy, when they just recognized from one of the first books that was out there that they're codependent. There was nothing available. And uh, so we, we basically had a, a we worked, we, we did a lot of our own therapy, therapeutic process for a while, individually and together. And then we uh, made a decision with the therapist to work the steps and to and none of us, including her, <laughs> knew what that meant. So we were basically stumbling through and educating ourselves and experimenting and trying different approaches to each step to figure out how codependence would, uh, would apply to the step and the step apply to me and Mary and us because um, there was there was no precedent for it. And um, the, the step work that I had done in, um, in a pre the previous program, I was, um, when I started that therapeutic process, I was seven, about a little over seven years clean and sober and worked in the industry. 
and and uh, we had codependence was this enigma that we were trying to figure out and understand, and we didn't know that it was the core behind all our addiction, all other addictions. And when we started treating it, um, relapse and recidivism rates reduced greatly. And um, but we just we were all experimenting. We were kids in this field and we were trying to figure out what is this strange thing called codependence and how are we going to deal with it? Um, so basically we worked the steps, we being Mary and I worked the steps with us, with our therapist and, uh, um, and realized after completing the steps and other recovery related work, uh, it, it, we had no place to go. I, I had uh, um, I had tried sharing some of my more vulnerable experiences in, in uh, meetings that I went to on a regular basis, AA and NA, and I was told that we don't talk about those things here. You need to talk about those things with your, with you, with your sponsor or your therapist. My sponsor actually said this to me, and I said, well, you are my sponsor. He got mad, and he said, well, you know what I mean. You know, and I scratched my head and I went, I don't know what you mean, you know, but I got it that we weren't going to be sharing those types of things. You know, part of my history and background, including, you know, abuse and incest and that type of stuff. And rightfully so, you know, because AA and NA are programs designed to help people stay clean and sober. They're not designed to help people move through core traumas, uh, shame addictions to fear uh, and those types of things and so so we basically worked the steps uh, like I said with our therapist and learned a great deal and interestingly enough as when we when we were writing the coda book and um, we were writing about the step work we, we those experiences that we had in therapy helped us greatly in writing about the steps and how to approach them. Uh, um, and it, it was really, we were both uh, grateful that we had those experiences to fall back on and to draw from in terms of writing those areas of the code. So, um, uh, the codependence is all about how do I relate to myself? How do I relate to a higher power and how do I relate to others? It's an issue of relationship or relating. And I learned very skewed ways to uh, relate to a higher power and to myself and to others. <clears throat> and the steps show us the priority of healing those relationships. And the first three obviously get me right in my relationship with my higher power. They, they continue to help me stay focused that my higher power is just that. It is the source of my power, my well-being, my life, my presence, my existence, and that I gave all that away as a codependent to others. And um, But the first three steps keep me focused on the fact that my the, my well-being with my relationship with myself and others is dependent on the quality of my relationship with my higher power. And my relationship with Barry is re re directly related uh, to the, and the quality of it is related to the quality of my relationship with myself. And that's directly related to the quality of my relationship with my higher power. So the first three get me right with my relationship with my higher power. The next four steps, uh, four, five, six, and seven, help me to get right in my relationship with me. They, they help me recognize that I have to learn to either like, love, and adore, and appreciate me, or continue to treat me with fear, with shaming, comments, with judgments, with contempt, with all the other things that I grew up treating myself with. And, and medicated with lots of different things, including obviously alcohol and drugs. And so six and seven helped me to straight to to clear out and clean the wreckage and recognize how I had been treating others and myself and God. Um, 
but they primarily helped me to recognize what I needed to do to develop a relationship with myself. And so uh, eight and nine, then as I built strength through my step work with my higher power and with myself, helped me to build strength to be able to do uh, steps eight and nine and make amends, but do it with integrity and not in shame, and toxic shame. Uh, humility, yes, healthy shame, but not toxic shame. And so, it, um, so for our purposes here today, we're, I wanna focus on, <clears throat> excuse me, on steps six and seven. Um, and, uh, I need to change the slide. <laughs> um, step six, uh, we're entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character. And step seven, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. And in focusing on the sixth step, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I've got some allergies going on, so I may need to stop for a minute and drink some water. Um, the step, step six has always been, uh, for me, the step of willingness and readiness. And both willingness and readiness have emerged for me uh, through uh, an honest and thorough, and I, I underline heartfelt four step inventory that when I could take an honest look without toxic shame, but an honest look at um, my shortcomings, and I'll talk a little bit about what I believe about the difference between the phrase uh, character defects and, and shortcomings in, in a little while. But when I could look at my list and shortcomings, it, it, it truly would, it humbled me and it allowed me to be ready and willing to do something to change these behaviors because I had pretty much in, in my uh, history, had my codependent dynamics had pretty much destroyed almost every relationship I had. It destroyed three marriages, it destroyed friendships, it threatened my relationship with my children um, because I had no idea how to be a parent. Uh, it, 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 it constantly caused havoc in my relationship with myself because I didn't see myself as a loving man. I could put on the act, what we affectionately call the all together act, you know, the right clothes, the right car, the right neighborhood, the right behaviors, the right 2.5 kids and the living in, living in the right home with the, the right vacation. So I can tell everybody I want a vacation to these places. You know, the right labels in the right clothes. The, uh, everything looking good out there so that you won't judge me and that you'll tell me I must be enough. And, and if I could do all of that, then I would be okay. But behind the scenes where there was a constant fear and shame dialogue going on in my head. And it was so normal and familiar to me that it, um, it, it I had no idea that that was actually necessarily unhealthy or um, abusive in, in any way, shape, or form until I really took a hard line look in a first step and looked at what happened to me. And in a fourth step, out of everything that happened to me, what did I become? What were my shortcomings? What were, what were my lies, my avoidances, control, managements, manipulations, my minimizings, my playing big, playing small? You know? what, what was my part in all of this and how did that translate into how I related to Mary for example to my kids how I related to friends and how I related to um, a work environment she was probably you know even as unhealthy as it was it was probably the healthiest area that I could be in was at work uh, when I left work I was left to my own devices and I'd have to come home and <clears throat> interact with Mary and my kids and ex-wives and <laughs> uh, family and friends. And I really didn't know, I did not know how to do that very well. Um, so the, the sixth step 
helps remind me that I, I need to remain ready and willing. And, and uh, as I've grown and I've, I've continued to become more open over the years, um, it's been easier for me to recognize more subtle shortcomings. And so uh, it, I, I wish that there was a way that, okay, I did a six and seven step. I've taken care of all my shortcomings, it's all done. It was an event, I'm fixed and everything's wonderful now. It just doesn't work that way, never has. <laughs> but I continue to learn and even recently solve um, a shortcoming that I'm, I'm uh, consciously focusing on. But to do it without, um, to do it with true humility and without toxic shame. Uh, for me, one of my biggest fears of doing a four step inventory, which kept me from getting to six and seven, um, was the toxic shame I would feel. It, it, you know, taking a look at my shortcomings, my list from my first four step and future four steps, I, I, I had to work to not start judging myself and something's wrong with me. I'm less than, I'm really screwed up. I don't even know why I'm working in this industry. What's, you know, all the toxic messages that would play out in my head. And you didn't shame me. I did. It's like shame and fear are very interesting. We project it onto the world. You know, I, I, I've said this many times, but I haven't met the person yet who's actually met they. And they are the ones that I'm afraid of. What will they think? What will they say? What will they do? Um, and I haven't met them, but boy, they're alive in a world inside my head. And they go a little crazy you know, to town on me. Don't wear that, don't act that, oh, don't say this, oh, you better be, and oh, you know, all the messages with the tones, voices, and inflections of the authorities from my childhood that are alive and well in my head. I don't fear you. You don't scare me. You, you, none of you do, and you never have. The fact is, I scare myself about you. I judge myself about you. You glance a certain way, I judge myself. And those were shortcomings that I really needed to take a hard line look at that, it, that learn that in one way, I had to learn that it didn't matter what you thought. That I had, all that matters what I thought about you. And did I think about you with fear and shame or did I think about you with love, with, uh, boundaries with integrity. Those were some of the things that began to play out as I progressed in my codependence recovery because I saw more subtle ways by which I needed to take a look at my shortcomings, more subtle shortcomings. Some of them even stored at the subconscious level that took a while to work the way up so that I could then apply them to and share them in the fifth step, you know, apply them to six and seven. Some of them I could do and just simply through 10th step. And some of them I had to focus more intense energy on. Um, so I, I'd like to read uh, uh, an excerpt from uh, the Coda book, chapter three, um, uh, about the sixth step. Uh, six step asks us to begin taking positive action towards changing those defects of character we outlined in our fourth step. It is a part of our cleansing process. Now we must apply the faith and trust we developed while working our second step and third steps and put them into greater action. In doing so, we take the decision of turning our will and our lives over to the care of God and advance one step further by becoming willing and ready for God to remove our defects of character. Um, I included here, and I want to take a minute to talk about this. Um, I included here just a statement at the bottom. I will be using the term shortcoming instead of defects of character. And there's some reasons why. Um, I realized many years ago um, that the, the phrase defects of character is a very shaming and judgmental and critical phrase. And it implies that I was defective, 
that my character wasn't good enough. It implies that something was wrong with me, that uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it bothered me enough to where I started doing um, more research prior, I've done a lot of research prior to our developing uh, CODA and CODA's literature. And, as when code was brand new, um, but I hadn't explored this particular aspect of it. And basically, um, to uh, you know, to understand this, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the history of the steps. Um, uh, Eighty-five years ago, uh, there were only six steps, and the six, st the first six steps were developed by a Christian organization called the Oxford Group. And their intent was to um, help alcoholics stop drinking, but they viewed alcoholics and drug addicts as morally bankrupt, <laughs> as wrong, as defective, as immoral. Um, and the vernaculars of the day 85 years ago in terms of how alcoholics and drug addicts were viewed especially alcoholics at that time. And, um, and, and Bill W. Was, had become a part of that organization. Um, and in, in a very short period of time, for many reasons, not just uh, uh, what I want to address, but for many reasons, he and others left the Oxford group and founded AA. And then uh, uh, soon after that, I think, Bill recognized that, that there was far more that we needed to address than the first six steps. And so he wrote the last six steps at his kitchen table one night, and, uh, which just kind of blows me away. The inspiration he must have had at that moment to be able to write that in the way that he did. And so, um, and basically, he he wrote the seventh step, I believe, and I because it's not around, I can't ask him. <laughs> but he wrote the second step, the seventh step, as his version of the sixth step. And instead of calling uh, our shortcomings uh, character defects or defects of character, which is again, it's moralizing, it's shaming, it's. Um, it devalues who I am as a human being. Shortcomings are simply a way to describe the fact that these are behaviors that I have that, that fall short of loving. They're behaviors that I have that, that don't allow me to, um, uh, uh, allow me to allow you to put your hand on my heart. Uh, these are behaviors that when I'm scared, I will cover up with anger. These are behaviors that I, mean, I could go down a long list of my shortcomings. Um, so I, I, won't, I won't go through that now. But and so he he um, he basically, I believe that the sixth and seventh steps, in essence, say the same thing. In the spirit and the heart of the six and seven steps, um, they're very similar. But I prefer and believe in how it is stated in the seventh step because it is a, a caring way to recognize that, that we are the problem. We need to deal with our side of the fence, no matter what. And if I don't, it's not going to get better. And, um, so um, with that said, I, I prefer in, in every case uh, and have for a long time to simply use the term shortcomings and that is my preference. And, uh, and I prefer to teach that because I felt as long as I kept reinforcing using the phrase character defects or defects of character, that I was reinforcing some form of judgment and shame. And I'm not willing to do that, not today. So um, with that, I want to move on to um, the next page, which is some questions that we adapted for this particular uh, workshop. And they are. And I just wanted to read through them. Uh, the first being, how do I become entirely ready? Uh, what are shortcomings? 
Can I accept my shortcomings without judgment? How can I overcome any resistance I feel to hearing I have shortcomings? And what prompts me to justify or minimize these shortcomings? And so what I'd like to do is um, ask you to take about 10 minutes or so and just uh, pick one or two of these to write about. Uh, I wanted to continue on to step seven, um, uh, but I also want to make a comment. I had written a note here just about um, that shortcomings, uh, it was a, a, a huge awakening for me to recognize that shortcomings were a skewed form of love, that I had learned to use shortcomings to protect myself, um, to, uh, to try to get what I want and to protect myself from being hurt uh, by others. Um, and they were all learned. Um, I didn't, I wasn't born with shortcomings. So I had to ask myself many years ago, well, where did they come from? Well, they were all learned from patterns and even some I learned from television as a kid, believe it or not. Um, but my shortcomings were ways that I learned to <clears throat> stay safe somehow and, and were almost always driven by fear and shame. And uh, I think it was Conway. I, th I liked, for me, I liked, I liked the fact that it, it, feelings, because uh, uh, codependence is all about feelings. And for me, uh, feelings drove me to do six and seven, the feelings that came out of uh, step four and five. So, so moving on to the seventh step, uh, the seventh step has always been the step of humility for me. And the step of humility, uh, ha for me, humility has to do with my humanness. It lets me know that I'm fallible, that I'm, 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 a, I'm a, a work in progress, that I'm uh, always changing and hopefully always evolving. And that I can make mistakes. That uh, it basically tells me that I'm a human being, and and I'm I'm still a work in progress, and I will be until I leave this world. I'm sure. Um, uh, to me, healthy or humility is associated with healthy shame. So, the pain, the guilt, and the shame. Healthy guilt and healthy shame came out of my fourth step inventory and the list of shortcomings that were uh, so glaring and obvious to me, left me on a heartfelt level <clears throat> feeling pain, shame, excuse me just a minute, <clears throat> feeling pain, shame, and, um, and guilt, which motivated me to want to change because uh, I didn't like how I felt. I didn't like what it meant to me. So um, I wanted to uh, bring up another slide. And this one is also from uh, the Code of Blue Book, uh, chapter three on step seven. Having asked God to remove our shortcomings, many of us experienced their loss with sadness. We had never expected to grieve for what we had come to believe was detrimental to our happiness. We began to see that these old friends had served us well. Like a child, like a childhood life preserver that no longer fit, we put them aside, and with the help of God, we were learning to swim. And completing step seven, we allow our higher power to guide our lives and the healing of our codependent behaviors. We begin to understand that our recovery can continue only through our higher power's love and care. We no longer play God or place others in that role. We become partners with our higher power, and we ask for God's help as we apply healthy new behaviors in our relationships with God, ourselves, and others. Um, I want to move on to the questions uh, for step seven. And uh, as we did with step six, we'll do the same thing with step seven. Uh, what does humbly ask God mean to me? What does humility mean to me? In what ways might step seven assist me in my recovery? And get, get my head out of the way. <laughs> How can I let go of my self will as I work steps on? A little bit to um, uh, probably a simple 
tool, probably the one of the simplest I've ever found in doing uh, six and seven. Right? It's like, how do we convert knowledge into action? And uh, this tool came to me, gosh, many years from ago. I, I had a, uh, I have a dear friend in, um, in another program, uh, Jimmy S. in Las Vegas, and he sent this to me and, and just want to know what I thought of it. He'd been using it with his, with his sponsees, and, um, and I fell in love with it right away. It was pretty powerful, um, and I've since adapted it a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here. And so I want to go through it first, and you're welcome to uh, print this, copy it, whatever you want to do. Um, but it's it, it's a it's a tool that does many things, but it, it helps us um, when we look at our shortcomings. It can be overwhelming about how am I going to change all of this, and what do I deal with first, and how do I go after all of this, and and, and this tool helps us focus only on one at a time. So it helps eliminate that. It gives us a, a simple process every day to deal with one item at a time. And as many times as we need to until that particular habit, because that's all shortcomings are, are habits. And until that particular habit is gone, we replace it with a new behavior. So with that, I'm gonna uh, change the slide and I'll read through uh, 12, these 12 different steps in relationship to this exercise. And so um, the first is, is, you know, writing out what do shortcomings mean to you? Um, and then the, number two, review your fourth step and identify all your shortcomings and make a list and, uh, and encourage people to do that with, um, uh, their support system with their sponsor, um, and, and you know it may have already been made because uh, uh, most times our shortcomings come from our four-step inventory. Um, but I, I have some concerns, and I'll come back to that after we get finished with twelve about about attempting to do this work uh, by ourselves without sponsors and support systems. Uh, number three, for each shortcoming, write one sentence on a three by five card of what you are trying to gain by this behavior and the effect this behavior has on yourself and others. Number four, for each shortcoming, write a new belief, thought, and behavior on the opposite side of that card. And for each new thought, belief, or behavior, write one sentence of how your life will be different if you act and think in this new way and apply it to your life. Um, number six, define your willingness to have these shortcomings removed. Fold your card, your three by five card, and place them in a jar. <clears throat> each day, choose only one card to focus on and carry that with you throughout the day. Uh, release all outcomes uh, to God and to let go of all expectations of outcomes. And at the end of the day, uh, place, uh, my head's in the way there. <laughs> um, place the drawn card in a second jar. Uh, draw a new card from the, fol uh, the following day. And once the second jar is filled with your cards, repeat the process. And, um, Carry, carrying that one card with us, or it's been amazing. I've heard so many people share with me. I don't know what it is, but I, I draw a card out of there and sure enough, I have all these experiences throughout that day that simply gives me an opportunity to practice the new behavior with this new situation or person or place or whatever it might be. And it's amazing, almost like God's reading my mail. <laughs> it's a whole of course, what do you think? Where do I think it comes from? It comes from my, my higher power. Uh, I even believe that the one that I may draw is directly the one I need to a draw for that day. And um, it, it's much easier to focus on one behavior and pay attention to it with empowerment, with love, with care, and with a, a cold process for me anyway, uh, with my higher power, um, rather than that whole list and try to sort out what's what I need to focus on, prioritize, uh, 
lists like that drive me crazy. So this is a very simple tool that has been helpful for me uh, when I have when I'm trying to deal with more than one item um, and keeps me out of feeling overwhelmed by it. Um, so we we. we, we it's interesting that whatever we draw, we will draw to us. And uh, my experience has been that once I'm, I've integrated the new behavior as a new habit, that I no longer feel the need to even carry that car to put it in the jar. But my experience has also been that as I move forward in my recovery and my life, more subtle shortcomings have come up. So this has been a simple way for me to write them out put the new behavior on the backside, put that in the jar and start working with that one. And um, so I, you know, I'm, because I'm a work in progress, I've always been changing my behaviors. I, if you've met the one who's arrived and doesn't need to do that, please, I'll give you my, my private cell number. You call me and tell me where they are because I won't let them <laughs> badly. Um, but I haven't met them yet, not in 45 years of, of doing this work. So. Um, uh, I, I will tell you that in doing the step work and doing this exercise and applying all of this to my life, you know, just some of the gifts that have come forward for me and that have meant a lot to me. I could spend all day just talking about those, but the ones that uh, in the last few days as I was kind of preparing my notes for this that have, have jumped out at me were, were through six and seven, uh, you know, step work for me. To the best of my ability, I'm able to stay present, um, and I'm, I'm I'm usually pretty good in my career to uh, staying present. But when it comes to my interpersonal relationships, um, that's been that has been a difficult one. But today, for the most part, I'm able to stay present. I share my feelings in healthy ways. I stop toxic thoughts like judgments, fears, and shames because they're all mine. You know, like I said before, nobody's scaring me. I scare myself about you. <laughs> and that same situation may not scare another person. Well, what's the difference? Well, it's because I'm scaring myself. And, and so intervening on my, on my fear, which keeps me away from my higher power because fear and love cannot coexist at the same time. Um, and, she, and, and dead, the toxic shame, which devalues who I am as a human being, and staying away from the judgments of myself and others, which means I'm playing God at, at those moments, uh, the more I can intervene on those thoughts, the better I feel. And today, because that's not part of my normal daily life anymore, when I do experience these, um, I feel it right away. I don't like how it feels. I don't like the anger that comes up in response to the fear, the shame, and the judgments. Um, I, I, and and that, that discomfort pushes me to deal with it as fast as I can because um, I used to tolerate freight trains full of pain and shame and anger and you name it. Uh, you get, you know, and I was just oblivious to the fact that I didn't have that. Today, give me about that much and I'll do something to deal with it right away because I don't like how it feels. I love how the cover feels. I love that recovery allows me to have my feelings and my feelings aren't bad. There's no such thing as a bad feeling. Um, they became bad for me when feelings that I didn't deal with got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. The pain wasn't like this anymore. The pain was massive over just this. Or the anger was reactive off the scale or the fear was traumatizing me or the shame was traumatizing me. Today, I don't experience that. Today, it's, it's in normal, <clears throat> as a, a friend of mine by, <laughs> likes to use the phrase right-sized, right, normal, healthy, right-sized self-parenting approaches to life. Um, I, I, I pretty consistently treat myself with love and care and compassion. I, I see myself as I and others as equal. Um, I allow others to be who they are and I practice loving God, myself and others each and every day. And I don't do any, any of those with perfection but, uh, because I'm a work in progress. But I, I live far more in the recovery side of each of these than I ever have in my entire life. And my life just becomes amazing 
as a result of this work and six and seven and the steps work and the work that we continue to do, um, Mary and I will celebrate 38 years married on New Year's Eve, which we found a delightful way to celebrate New Year's Eve without alcohol and drugs, um, and 39 years together. So uh, we're really excited. We're getting close to that 40 year mark and it's kind of scary. I don't know what the heck that means. I'm not a believer much in numbers and age and that type of thing, because really this is all there is for me today, my, uh, the opportunity to be here and share with you guys. I could go on about the, the blessings and the gifts of recovery. Um, that I, what I wanted to do was make sure we create uh, some time now for uh, questions and answers, and, and I want to move right into it. I don't know how much time we have left, probably about 35 minutes, so it looks like. So, uh, I'm just going to move to end. Uh, yes, uh, toxic. Well, toxic feelings are um, are toxic because they've accumulated. You know, I've, I've learned over the years that you know feelings don't disappear. If I don't give them expression, they stay stored in my body. And I'm I'm convinced today that they stay stored in my body long enough, they start to manifest illness wherever they're stored in my body. And so um, I need to I need to be present for my feelings and express them in healthy ways, even if it's through journaling uh, each day, moving that emotional energy out of my body. But for years, I repressed and stuffed and suppressed and depressed and stuffed and where it was right to here. And so if this much happened in my life, then all of this pain would come. And, and it felt overwhelming and toxic. And it was toxic because I had never let it all out. <laughs> I had never moved through it, which recovery has allowed me safe ways to be able to move through my emotional recovery. Um, and, and I do want to talk about specifically about healthy shame versus toxic shame. So healthy shame is about my actions or lack of actions, what I said or did, didn't say or didn't do. And especially, uh, I believe I, I have experienced shame when my actions were done with intent. Not only am I going to feel guilt, but I'm going to feel ashamed of what I did or said or didn't say or didn't do because I really intended to do something that hurt someone. Um, but it's still about my actions, not who I am. Toxic shame is always an I am statement. And my subconscious mind takes it literally. It doesn't know how to make a differentiation one way or the other. So if I feed it my subconscious mind, then I'm worthless. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I'm worthless. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. Oh God, what's wrong with me? I'm worthless. I'm not well, pretty soon the subconscious mind, just like the hard drive on a computer, goes, oh, normal information, I'm worthless, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough. So and it, and and the, the phrase, the word, the phrase I am is always a all inclusive to the subconscious mind. I am worthless. It has nothing to do with actions. It has everything to do with all that I am. <laughs> the subconscious mind doesn't know the difference. And so whatever I feed it, it believes. And, and you know, the old timers many years ago, I heard them say, and they have to you can feed the shame dog, or you can feed the love dog. Either way, you're right, and you're going to experience uh, benefits or consequences. So dealing with toxic shame has been a significant part of my personal recovery. All the toxic messages emotionally, physically, sexually, intellectually, spiritually that I took on and that have been programming and generating pain and shame and anger and loneliness, most of my uh, addictive life and early recovery life I had to deal with, and they came out of my trauma and experiences. They came out of how I was treated by authority figures. They came from all sorts of sources and, and their lies. Today, I believe toxic shame are lies that I learned to believe were true as a child because I didn't know anything different. And toxic fear are the lies I tell myself about how bad it's going to be. Toxic shame is the lies I tell myself about how bad I am. Is that helpful? It was pretty amazing. Um, it was, um, I'm trying to, I couldn't, I think it was a Friday night anyway. Uh, it was today, 35 years ago. <laughs> 
and uh, it was in West Phoenix at uh, an Episcopal church. Uh, one of our priests for a while was one of our board members and he was able to talk the church into creating space for us. Cool. And I asked people, you know, uh, who I knew didn't have, a, didn't have a program for CODA, but they were in other programs, but were working on CODA Pennants if they would be willing to, you know, share at the meeting and absolutely not, absolutely not. No, I can't do that. It's like, okay, so I, I, I mean, I sort of tossed a coin and I, I won, so I got to share. Um, and it was just amazingly powerful um, to be in a room full of people who were, who felt free enough and safe enough to be able to talk about codependent issues and for the first time any, any, anywhere in a 12-step process. And that meeting grew. Um, the second week, it grew to about 60 people. The third week, it grew to 90 people. And we, had to, we had to move the meeting each week. And finally, we were in the main, main body of the church. We had well over 100 people in a month. And right after that, the second meeting started. And actually, the second meeting is still in existence here. It's moved recently uh, a few times, but it's still in existence. And, and um, um, it was it, it both, it left both married, whew, I, I didn't feel it today, whew, left us both in tears at, at how amazing um, you know, God's will was at that time, still is today, and how powerful uh, it's grown since then. I think today, as of today, we've got meetings in 69 countries. So, and we scratch our heads all the time going, mm, where were we, how did that happen? <laughs> well, wait a minute, wait, you know, <laughs> and, and, and gratefully so, but I think, thank you for asking, it's nice to repeat, it, it hasn't. It's still humbling. It, it, I, I, what has changed is I do, I'm able to actually do six and seven far more quickly. There's times when I can do it in my head. Sometimes I need to journal. Sometimes I need to go through the whole process. But, but um, it, and, and my experience of uh, seeing or, or experiencing those shortcomings is it's farther and farther and farther and farther and farther apart. It doesn't mean I'm still not evolving, but but I'm evolving. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I don't have one foot caught in my history and in my here and now. Because my shortcomings all come from my history. For this, and there's a couple of reasons why I was, I debated whether I was going to say something or not, but I think it's important to say it. Um, Doing this alone is like trying to do open heart surgery on ourselves. It literally is. If I'm going to do a heartfelt, open hearted evolutionary change through the steps, which goes to my core issues, um, uh, it, it means I'm going to do, I'm going to do, in a sense, spiritual open heartedness. I'm going to allow myself to be as vulnerable and real as I possibly can. To do it by myself is just reinforcing for me the same old codependent dynamics. I did everything by myself. And so I heard somebody share with me, they, they, they told me they, I, I knew someone who was in another program that they were new to CODA and that they had asked at a CODA meeting if anybody would be willing to be their sponsor. And at least even temporarily, and a whole room full of people, nobody responded. And she said that kind of surprised her. Uh, because in other programs, it's immediate. You get a sponsor as fast as possible so that you're not sitting in your stuff for months and years. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and she said a person approached her afterwards and she said, you don't, you don't need a sponsor. You can work the steps by yourself. And it seriously troubled my heart in a huge way because I, I think that is a setup for failure. And I told her that. And, and she said, well, I could figure that out right away. I've been in other programs and, you know, uh, I just never knew how to work this as it relates to our code of recovery. And I know that sponsors, you know, people are a little reticent, reticent to volunteer as a sponsor. I, I, there's good literature materials about being a sponsor. Um, 
And, and so I, doing this tool or any other kind of significant recovery, I think is so important to have a sponsor. So important. And, and a support group of people that, you know, my sponsor might, I might need to talk to my sponsor in a heartbeat and they're in the bathroom. <laughs> and they're probably not going to answer the phone, you know, so I need to call some other folks if I need to, or they're on vacation or whatever. And so having a, a group of people that, I mean, I would tell you today that there isn't anybody that I spend significant time with in my life that isn't in recovery and it doesn't work also codependence recovery. And a lot of folks, I mean, because of our age in recovery, a lot of the folks we spend time with have 30, 35 years more, you know, of recovery. But, um, and cultivating those relationships takes time. But avoidance is 50% uh, of the issue of codependence. You know, there, well, codependence comes in two packages. One is avoidant codependent, and the other is enmeshed codependent. And avoidance, I was both. And in my avoidance, I was saying, I was so afraid of you hurting me that I'm going to stay distant. And I'm fearful of you, and et cetera. And the other was, I'm so afraid of being alone that I need to attach to you because you're my all and you complete me and everything's good if I'm connected to somebody, you know? And so uh, by trying to work a program by ourselves, it, it really is reinforcing our avoidance. Because that is for all of us. The core addiction for codependence is the addiction to fear. Fear and shame. Uh, Bill W. knew half of it. He knew that alcoholism was a, a, a medication for fear, and fear was an alcoholic's dilemma 85 years ago. We didn't know that, 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 that until we, the advent of codependence and understanding codependence is the, the, the most profound fear for most human beings is a fear of more shame. The fear of not being enough one more time. The fear of not fitting in, being dumb, being stupid, too tall, too short, not worthy, worthless, a piece of whatever, you know, all of these thousands of toxic shame messages. And, and so for me, two things work well. One is, I have to intervene on the fear thought because fear always starts with a thought first. And that's the fear story that I make up in my head about how bad it's gonna be. It's always about the future. It's something I tell myself, I got this terrorist inside who scares me about you. And until I get strong enough inside, that part of my brain I call the self-parent or the recovering part of me that intervenes on that fear thought and says, back off, shut up, and don't talk to me. Else. That's helpful to me. Yeah, but no, because it's, it, it's accumulated fears or is accumulated um, defense mechanism from very, very young ages. It's a child's, in my world, it's a child's way of trying to protect itself. And so I need to be in on it. I reassure that little boy and tell him it's okay, I got this. And Today, he trusts me because he's seen that I've got it, that I won't let people harm him and, and I'll take care of him. But uh, if, if the fear is strong enough, I've suggested with people that I've worked with all, over the years as sponsees is, is do, a fir, do, a, do a series of the, of the steps on fear. And when we get to the fourth step, how have I scared myself? What do I tell myself? What do I say? Because until I see it, I can't intervene and create the truth because fears are lies. Not happening right now. It might happen two days from now. Right now, I'm having a miserable, a miserable day because I scared myself about what might happen two days from now. <laughs> so at the, in the fourth step, it's a, it's a beautiful place for me to take a look at how am I scaring myself? What do I say? What do I do? How do I do that to me? Where did this come from? First step is who taught me to be so afraid? How did I become powerless in my life become a man? And behind that is probably some tears. I understood that you, it was being described was when we're triggered. When we have emotional energy where 
uh, it, it's pouring forth and, and my history is, is being projected right here and right now. And so uh, I had to learn, because I was triggered a lot, because I had huge amounts of barrels of pain, shame, anger, loneliness, and guilt that when I, you know, I didn't know what to do with, you know, you know, like, like I said, feelings stay stored in the body until I deal with them. So uh, you said you like Mary would roll her eyes. She didn't know what she was doing. She just rolled her eyes and I go, Oh, what's that about? <laughs> and I get right in her face about something, you know, what does that mean? You know, or she'd sigh and I go, what, What's that about? Because, you know, all this emotional energy would come up and I had to recognize I'm emotionally triggered. And when I'm emotionally triggered, I needed to separate myself from the situation because no good communication ever comes from one or two people being emotionally triggered. So I had to learn how to just say I'm triggered. I need to go look at this and go get, grab a piece of paper. That is, when my emotional energy is about three or more on a 10 point scale, I'm triggered. I need to go get a piece of paper and sit down and write who, what, when, where, and how does this remind me of from my past? Because I'm gonna connect the dots between this emotional energy that I'm still carrying and the source of this emotional energy in the past from an experience or many experiences. Then I can focus my emotional energy that way and write about it talk about it, process it. And then when I'm done with that, come back and about 90% of the time I'd look at Mary and there wasn't anything I needed to say to her about anything. She just actually sighed. <laughs> like, so, I mean, it's just, it, you know, anger was my give, my, my, my giveaway. If I was angry, I didn't do fear. I got angry. I didn't do pain. I got angry. I didn't do guilt. I got angry. So I would get triggered. And I had to break down when I gave up the anger, I had to break down what was really underneath all that anger and then connect the dots between my emotional energy because feelings feel real to me right now. And the fact is those feelings are real, but they're not connected to anything Mary did and I'm triggered. So I need to focus on my history because my belief is that being triggered is God's way of showing me I'm not done yet. It helps me recognize I'm a work in progress. I still have unfinished wounds. My emotions are showing them, themselves to me. And I have an opportunity to clean up the wreckage from my past again. And today being triggered is not, you know, it's like just part of my recovery process. But, but it took a long time to get there because being triggered, I hate it because all this emotional energy is called flooding, flooded my body and I couldn't think straight or see straight. Is that helpful? So I'm going to change this and just ask, I thank you all for your questions. I wish we had more time um, because they're great questions and there's so much information about codependence recovery that doesn't get out there. And we're grateful as part of actually Q&A or times that both Mary and I probably love more than anything because we get to interact with you and we get to be helpful in the ways that we know how. So. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for um, giving me this opportunity, being here, being present, and, and allowing me the time to share with you and to be facilitating this workshop. It's been delightful, and thank you all for being here. Um, would you help me close the meeting um, by reading uh, the third step prayer? God, I do. Uh I give to you all that I am and all that I will be for your healing and direction. Make new this day as I release all my worries and fears, knowing that you are by my side. Please help me to open myself to your love and to allow your love to heal my wounds and to allow your love to flow through me and from me to those around me. May your will be done this day and always. Amen.